it's really cool to be here. Uh, I haven't expected that many people. Um, and yeah, uh, maybe you've seen the session already uh, for two days on the bar camp. And this one will be a slightly extend, uh, extended version of that. So yeah, here we go. Um, uh, at first I'll give you a little overview. Um, I'll start off with the explanation of what, uh, what is architecture and uh, why is software architecture important and uh, yeah, how does it matter to you. Um, followed by some uh, principles you should uh, keep an eye on or you shouldn't avoid. Um, then it's about planning some stuff and planning your architecture using UML and stuff like that. Um, and at least uh, the name giving pitfalls, especially for Android. Um, yeah, some sm short infos about me. Um, I'm working for Kotato uh, for like four and a half years. Uh, I started off with Android with the first SDK three and a half years ago. Um, I'm also a freelancer for like over two years. Um, and yeah, and these are the most common devices I used. <laughs> um, so, uh, because I got some feedback uh, on the bar camp, uh, I changed my uh, session a little bit. Um, because um, after some discussions I found out that architecture is a real discussable uh, topic and so um, it's all about architecture but the important thing is that especially in architecture there's no golden way you have to follow or something like that. There's no best best practice. It's all about your opinion, it's all about your experience uh, and of course it's all about uh, the style or um, the way you develop software. Um, Everything about architecture uh, has to match your opinion, has to match your style, how to want to develop it and how to want to use it. These are all recommendations. Um, and at least um, architecture is a very short dated term. So um, maybe if you use Scrum or something like that, uh, it can be that the architecture uh, has to be screwed after two weeks or something. Um, it's always about keeping and maintaining your architecture, which is really important. Um, and so the explanation of architecture. Um, this picture you see here um, is the Android framework architecture. Um, in this session it's not about that, I mean it's about your architecture. Um, but this picture gives you a good overview of how the Android framework um, is built on and what features it may offer to you and something like that. Um, and that's especially that what an architecture should do. It should expose its features and its structure to you so you see every important package and every important module um, without knowing the implementation details of it. And uh, furthermore, um, your architecture should realize all the use cases and scenario. So you know uh, what this architecture and this framework can offer you without knowing too much detail in it. Um, especially in Android, uh, maybe you know Android isn't pure Java, it's even more than that. Um, you've got special stuff you really should um, keep an eye on, special stuff you really should know before you start off with developing. Um, and especially when it's about planning your architecture, um, you should uh, really know those uh, simple modules. Um, of course, if you already did in Hello World and even more, uh, you're very familiar with activities and services and stuff like that. Um, and especially activities and um, fragments and so on uh, does have a life cycle. And um, this life cycle is really important for your architecture. Um, you can't build an app and can't build an architecture without having an eye on this and without knowing what you're doing. If you um, try to avoid or um, the life cycle of your activity and something like that, uh, you really get into problems. Um, and furthermore, uh, the intent principle in uh, Android is really, really great. Um, you can do lots of stuff with it. Um, but uh, you really should know what you're doing and you should, shouldn't misuse it. Um, I've seen a lot of code and a lot of projects where interns were used for something it wasn't intended to be and even it's an, an intent. Um, so really be familiar with these components to build great apps and build a great architecture. Um, and as I already said, uh, the life cycles in Android are really important. Um, at first, if you start with Android, um, it might look a bit confusing, but um, there are yeah, it's, it's quite common, it's quite understandable if you um, uh, do your first app and something like that. Um, and there are a lot of stuff which may be important. So if you're familiar with the life cycle, and maybe at first if you start off the activity life cycle will be enough from the beginning, um, then you can do great apps, but you should always keep in mind that there is a life cycle and you have to handle it. And otherwise your architecture won't go, uh, get good. Um, so let's start off with the first principle and the first metaphor is, um, I said that um, software architecture and building apps is like building houses, so why is that? 
I mean, if you start off with an app, um, maybe you start with, with hacking, um, you just develop, you have an idea and you want to realize it. Um, if you want to build a house, you start off with, okay, how's my fundamentation? Um, what things ha do I have to do? And you really start off planning. In software, it's mostly not like that. Um, so, especially in the beginning of a project, you should do a proof of concept. Um, if you start off with an app, just make sure that every feature you want to realize is even possible to realize. Mostly the people start developing apps and re re uh, during their development they realize, okay, that's not so possible, the APIs won't give me the option to that. Um, so make sure everything you want to develop uh, is possible and make sure it's in the beginning. Um, so especially in Scrum, uh, you have the uh, spike for that. It's like uh, you have a given time box to say, let's go, okay, uh, we have like five days to check uh, whether what we develop is possible with Android or something like that. Um, and if you don't get uh, an answer within that, you maybe should think about an alternative. And so it's really about having an idea that everything's possible and you won't get um, bad, horrible nightmares at the end of your development. So next principle is the KISS principle which is about um, keeping your architecture, your frameworks, and the tools you use uh, as much simple as possible. Um, maybe you're familiar with two st uh, these two games. <laughs> One of them is an SDK sample, uh, guess what? So um, with this simple snake SDK sample, and imagine you have a job to do, and imagine you have to develop a game, uh, especially like this simple snake. Um, you won't start off with something um, huge like Unity. Uh, maybe you won't even start off with OpenGL. Uh, you always have to guess or you always have to know um, what framework or what tools you're using are appropriate for that. So, uh, I mean, if you want to build a house or something like that, you always choose appropriate tools. Why don't do that in software development? Um, so if you want to develop a simple 2D game, a really, really simple game, maybe you can use it Canvas. Maybe you can use Ant Engine. If it's getting, getting bigger and bigger, you can use OpenGL, or if it's getting 3D or something, you can use Unity. But always choose an appropriate approach. Because, um, I mean, if you want to build a small house, you won't do it with a crane. That's, that's logical. But often in software development, um, people choose huge frameworks to realize simple projects. Um, there's also an anti-pattern for that, which is named Gas Factory which means you have small problems and you have big solutions or big possibilities to do that, but it's way oversized. So you really should often um, or always choose the right approach for that. So the next one um, is about uh, planning. It's about planning that really, really matters and is important. Um, in my case, I started with UML, something like that. Uh, you don't have to do that, of course. It's always about what you suits best, which is the most important principle of all. Um, but Yuma is, in my opinion, a real great way to do so. Um, so maybe um, you already seen these um, diagrams, there are lots of them, and you can pick up what you want, you can say, okay, uh, I'm not familiar with use cases, I don't like class diagrams, that doesn't matter, just choose what suits you best, that's really important. Um, so they are in, uh, divided into structure, behavior, and interaction diagrams, and they're, yeah, Every diagram of that has a special um, use case, a special um, choice to make, and really choose whatever suits you best. Um, in my case, I often start with um, use case diagrams. It's really simple, it's not that technical. Um, I can show it to customer and can say, hey, have a look, and that's what I think um, is the possibility to realize a project. I have some users involved in that, and I have, I have the features involved in that, and I can say that's my approach, may it be right. It's not technical. Um, and of course, with a use case, you get a good overview of all possible actions of your app. And you can change it in a really ill state. Um, mostly followed by that, I would start off with a class diagram, which is technical. Um, and especially in this one, you'll see there are clean dependencies. Of course, looks like huge, but um, there are a few classes, um, they have compositions to each other, but it's a clean architecture. They are only um, divided into a few parts, but it's, it's, it's clean. So um, if you start off with a class diagram, which isn't clean, which has too much dependencies, too much stuff related to each other, then you should think about and really should think about the architecture and maybe refurbish it or something. And um, after that, <laughs> It gets even more technical. You can do object diagrams um, to look, okay, um, what dependencies do I have? Uh, what may cause problems? What may cause bugs and something like that? But that's all recommendations. You can do whatever you want, but you should start planning. And it's about you, what tools you want to with. Um, and if you plan right, um, you may get a good architecture. 
So um, just in theory, it's like, okay, you have a clean, um, a clean plan from the beginning, that may lead to a clean architecture and that may lead um, to less bugs in the final product, but in reality it's not like that. <laughs> But um, if you have a clean architecture, you may know which modules may be affected of a bug and may be uh, refactored or something like that. And so it's mostly um, yeah, important that you plan something before you implement it. Of course you can hack it, it's all about you. But um, if you hack it, uh, you may have some disadvantages and later on it's really hard to refactor if you hack your whole project. So think about that. So elsewhere, maybe it's like building a house. If you don't plan it, it may get crap or something like that. And um, that's not cool. So um, yeah, next point is um, maybe when you start planning is to determine how big will your project get. I mean, just imagine building a simple house is common and everyone knows how to. But um, in software development, it's like, OK, um, I will to build a simple app, maybe a hobby app, a private app, or something just for you. It's, really simple. Then you choose a simple fundament, uh, uh, fundament. you have a simple architecture and that's okay. Um, maybe if you're a professional software developer, um, you start off with a bigger fundament. You know, things can get big and of course you start um, or you invest more time into planning in that, but that's okay and that's really important. Or otherwise, um, if you really know, hey, uh, I want to develop that next big thing, I want to develop a huge corporate app, then you really should uh, look for your fundament and you should really look that you get stuff clean from the beginning and don't hack uh, in an early state or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, the next principle is the dry principle, which means don't repeat yourself. Um, maybe you know that copy and paste leads to, uh, leads to errors and is really, really evil. Um, Furthermore, the dry principle is used in model-driven architecture um, and it's about that repetition leads to inconsistency. It means um, if you have a lot of code and you have a lot of duplicate code, uh, you don't know where to start fixing and it's not separated clearly and you have too much dependencies on it which are doubled. Um, and of course, that's really not cool because it leads to a lot of problems. And to avoid that, you should, as I already said, um, plan your architecture, have a clean architecture, and uh, don't overuse stuff too often. So otherwise, it's like building a house and saying, hey, why do inventing um, windows? I mean, I have a door, I can use it like that. In, in, uh, when building a house, no one would do that, but in software development, it might often is. It's like, hey, I've done something similar like that, why don't we use it? Um, yeah, reusing code is cool and uh, saves you a lot of time, but it should always be appropriate. Um, and so you really shouldn't overuse uh, your code. It's um, nearly similar to the second system syndrome. Um, there are a lot of people saying, hey, I already did something like that, why don't we use it? Or I always done it like that and I know how, how it's gone. Um, that may not always be the best way. It's like if you develop a game and develop another game, you can reuse your engine, you can reuse um, your architecture and something like that. Um, but no one would uh, do something like that if you have a corporate app and want to develop a game. It's really um, something different and it shouldn't re-overuse your stuff. Um, furthermore, um, if you develop and uh, start off with a cool architecture, you should look out for anti-pattern. Um, maybe most of you have already heard about spaghetti code, which means you don't have any structure in your code. It's always like um, screwed up and um, vice versa and something like that. Um, there's also the big ball of a mud pattern, which means um, your code works but doesn't have any architecture. It's not cool. Um, and of course, the gas fabric um, I was uh, always talk uh, already talking about, uh, which means you got a lot of code, you got a huge framework, but your problem is really, really small and it doesn't fit together. Um, furthermore, there's the got object anti pattern. Uh, which means your code is object oriented, but like, I don't know, 90% of your code is only in one class. And one class does it all. Maybe that is possible, and of course it can, be, can get a working app, but uh, if you want to refactor or debug it, it might get horrible. Um, and the least one in this list is the JoJo problem, uh, which is about like uh, flipping through code without any concept, and it's like the spaghetti code and something like that. Um, and there are a lot of more anti-pattern, but um, if you see yourself doing or repeating something like that, then you should really think about what you're doing. Or otherwise, it's like hacking, um, you lead to the pitfalls. And especially in Android, there are a lot of pitfalls you can fall into, um, so you should really watch out. And um, as Hassan uh, told us uh, yesterday in his session, there's a really huge device fragmentation. There are a lot of Android devices. 
um, it's around 2,700, he said, and that's really big. So um, their devices are not only uh, different in their speed and in their solution, something like that. Um, it's also about uh, that different vendors implement different stacks, UI trading and something like that. And you should always test your uh, app with some, uh, with some devices. The emulator is okay from the beginning, but if you want to have a cool app, if you want to develop a professional app, you should really start off with some devices. Um, especially the problem can be in game development. Um, if you create your own engine and uh, you want to not use uh, an, an existing engine, then you can get into problems and should really keep an eye on the device fragmentation. Um, the best advice for this to avoid device fragmentation and to, to avoid uh, bad code and something like that um, is to follow the best practices guidelines from Google. Um, all their samples are coded um, so that um, it will run on several devices uh, in the best way they can. And the more you stick to the best practices on Google and their code samples, um, the better your app will look on a, a whole bunch of devices. And so um, nearly coupled to the device fragmentation is the UI trading in Android. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with this. Um, it's about that Android uh, can use multi-threading and you can start threads uh, as much as you want. Um, but if you want to display dialogues and stuff like that, toast, or I don't know, uh, then you always have to have a context and you have to be in the UI thread. Um, if you don't, you get screwed. It's really horrible. Um, so the most important advice in this case is that you should really be cautious uh, with UI threading uh, and with multi-threading. If it's just a fire and forget action, then you can do it. But if you want to display UI again, then you should really use an adding task, which is a really cool wrapper for a thread. It's like you start off a work in the background and it runs asynchronously and at the end it says, hey, uh, I'm finished, uh, may I display some dialogues and stuff like that. Uh, and you're in the UI thread again and you don't, you don't have to care about if you're in the UI thread or not. Um, and before there was an async test, you had the option to do, use a looper and prepare the looper and something like that, but that gets really complicated, so I would really prefer the async test for that. Um, furthermore, to avoid um, leaks, especially in UI trading, um, is to don't reference uh, your actual context uh, in a static variable. It's like um, your activity is displayed, you can use it for um, displaying other dialogues and stuff like that. And if you hold that uh, activity or that context in a reference, and the activity is gone, you still have the reference to it. And if you then want to display dialogues, it crashes and uh, your activity um, gets an illegal state argument exception, which is not cool. So um, don't hold your activity in a static context, that's not cool. So next one is um, about Android's UI. Um, Android has a cool model view presenter, if you will call it like that. It's nearly different, but the activity does something like the presenter in that pattern. Um, it's like Android uh, gives you the option uh, to inflate all your UI out of XML. Um, you can also use fragments for that, of course. But um, using XML is a really important part in Android. Um, it saves you a lot of time. You have uh, the option to reuse it again and over it again. It's really cool. But if you don't, you might get into problems. Um, before Android 1.5, it was like um, the documentation didn't say clearly use XML as much as possible, but uh, nowadays it has, and you should really do it. Um, maybe you are already a Java programmer and you start off with Android, you're familiar with Swing, AVT or something, um, then you should not, uh, you should really not um, instantiate your, your UI as you did maybe in Swing. It's possible, but it's really, really um, error prone. So furthermore, it's really good to use XML, use a layout inflator for that. Um, you always have to have your context uh, in this case, but um, if you don't have your context in the static reference, as I already said, it might get good. So furthermore, um, there's a problem for orientation log. Um, as I already uh, shown, the life cycle in Android, which can get complicated and which might affect your architecture, you can get rid of it by just um, having this one simple line in your uh, manifest. Um, might sound good, and especially in iOS, it's quite common to have your apps locked in portrait mode only. Um, but in Android, it really sucks. It's like uh, you have so much devices, especially with the milestone, for an example, with full keyboard devices, uh, you shouldn't really lock your um, device orientation. Um, if you do, you have the advantage that you don't have to, have to, uh, don't have to handle the life cycle, which is cool and which um, saves you a lot of time. But otherwise, you don't have the options um, to have distinct layouts for landscape and portrait. Um, 
and which are just not cool if you have like a 10 inch tablet or a Google TV and um, your app is uh, flipped by 90 degrees. It just looks ugly and the usability and the user experience on that will really get worse. So um, yeah, there's always a stage you have already ready an app, you've developed it for a lot of time and then you know, crap, my architecture's gone, it's not really cool, um, debugging sucks, so I don't know. Um, then you should really start rethinking your architecture, rethinking what you did and where the problem um, does come from. Uh, furthermore, uh, if you thought about it, you redesign it and see, okay, that would be a cool architecture. Um, then you start refactoring it. Refactoring can get really horrible and can get really, um, yeah, time lasting, but really refactor your stuff if you want to have this app longer than, I don't know, some month. Um, then you can refurbish all the stuff and can uh, try to make a clean architecture out of your existing code. But it's always about having a good overview of what's possible and what's not. Um, and at least you can release the software again. And um, the most important part on this is that you don't have to fear to uh, refactor. Refactoring might be ugly, but uh, if it's worth its effort, just do it. It's really important. And um, if you think your architecture is messed up too, uh, uh, um, too much, then there's a possibility um, to use maybe the facade design pattern, which says, okay, um, hide all that crap architecture behind one class. In this case, it would be this one. Um, and it's nothing more than um, having a lot of classes, a lot of modules, and a lot of dependencies, um, and your final product is only talking to one object of that. Um, so you don't have to care up all the, uh, uh, to all the dependencies and so on. Um, maybe in this image, um, you can see it. It's like you're having, you have a lot of classes which depend uh, to each other, and at the end there's only one. So if you can hide all the bad architecture behind one object, that might be a good approach to start refactoring. Um, and furthermore, if you say, okay, these modules just depend to each other, but they're finished and they work as I wanted, then you can uh, hide it behind the facade and it saves you a lot of time. And of course, um, the bad architecture gets encapsulated behind that facade. So, um, so let's have a look, little conclusion. Um, if you start your architecture um, and you know about the anti-pattern and the life cycle and so on, um, and the KISS principle, you shouldn't really avoid it if you know, okay, um, I have to choose an appropriate way. That's always um, important. Um, furthermore, if you um, start an app and start an architecture, you should really determine the size of your project. How big does your project get? Um, then, of course, you should plan your architecture with all the given tools you want and whatever you want to have it. Um, you can use UML, you can use any stuff you want, but just try to plan it a bit. Um, furthermore, to avoid the device fragmentation, uh, you should rely on the Google best practices and the SDK samples and something like that. They're really, really great. Um, then, if your architecture already is scrap, uh, you should don't fear to refactor, uh, refurbish it, and maybe start something like start over. Um, then you should really look out for the pattern for spaghetti code and for all that God object stuff and something like that. Um, and of course, and at the end, you should really watch out for the pitfalls with UI threading, with instantiating uh, Android UI. And yeah, then you might get a clean architecture from the beginning during the development, and at least you can do your release as soon as possible. So it's my last slide. Um, if you want to contact me, you can add me on Google+. Plus. Um, you can write me an email, something like that, or have a look on my homepage. If you're looking for a good graphics designer, I can recommend you one. And yeah, I'm finished with the session, and thank you. <laughs>